Well, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, be able to share a few ideas with you. I thank Milbray and Sam and Mike for asking me to, to come and, and share some of uh, my professional work, which is some research uh, working with primarily African-American urban youth, but also some of my practice. I, I worked uh, in Oakland with African-American youth for over 20 years. Um, and so I'll share some of my professional career, some of my practice, but I want to start off with not my practice and not my profession, but something that's intensely personal. I want to be honest with you, and I want to share some ideas that I think um, are sometimes difficult. And it's a personal story. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, actually a year ago, I was having a very difficult time with my son. And uh, we were going through a period where everything I said, he would do the opposite. <laughs> Clean your room. No, dad. Stop picking on your sister. No, dad. So this one particular evening, my son uh, was not behaving, and I think I asked him to go clean his room. And he went to his room, and I went there five minutes afterwards, and his, his, his room wasn't clean. I said, son, I thought I asked you to clean your room. And he did something that he hadn't done before. He didn't disagree with me. He didn't, he didn't sort of fight with me. But what he did changed the direction in terms of my relationship with him. He looked at me like this. <laughs> <laughs> now, a 13-year-old, he's 13 years old. Now, most of you know what that means. <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> my 13-year-old son standing in my house in my room, the roof that I'm providing over his head challenges me with a look. So I knew at that time that I couldn't simply say, I, I'm taking your iPod, you can't ride your bike. I knew that the traditional ways of supporting him and disciplining him, I knew that that was insufficient at that moment. That there would need to be something much more profound so that he would understand our relationship, that I am the father and you're the son, and that I'm guiding you, and that my role as a father, as my father, is to guide you down a path so that you can become a healthy, productive adult. Taking the iPod wouldn't do that, and I was so furious, I didn't know what to do. Um, I, I uh, asked him to get in the car and so we could take a drive. My wife wasn't home, and she didn't actually hear about this story until two years later. <laughs> She saw it on, I did a talk and shared this story, it was on YouTube. And she's like, <laughs> so we took a drive, we took a drive, and for those of you who know Oakland, uh, Oakland is uh, separated by the flatlands and the hills. And on the other side of the hills are, uh, is Redwood Road, and Redwood Road is a very windy road. And so I got in the car and we began to drive, I didn't say much. But we just began to drive, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but when we got onto Redwood Road at 9 o'clock at night, it was dark, I pulled the car over to the side and I said, son, um, I know this road very well. And I, I know it because I ride bikes. I ride every week. I ride this, 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 this road you know, all the time. I know all the turns in the road. I know all the, where the gravel is. I know where the cliffs are. I know this road very well. And if you don't listen to me tonight, we're going to have a difficult time. So I asked him to do one thing. I asked him to get out of the car. He was in the passenger seat, and he walked around, and I got out of the driver's seat, and we switched. He got, at 13 years old, behind the wheel of my car, and I got into the passenger seat. And I said, okay, what I want you to do is put your foot on the brake, and I want you to accelerate slowly. He looked at me, thought I was joking. I said, I want you to listen to me. Because if you listen, we'll get home tonight. But if you don't, we're not going to make it. <laughs> and I was very serious. So he put his foot on the brake. Then he, then he took his foot off the brake and he began to accelerate. I said, I want you to accelerate up to 30 miles an hour. I don't want you to get nervous because there's probably raccoons and deer that are across the street because it's at night. And he began to drive, and sure enough, about 50 yards ahead, a couple raccoons came, uh, uh, ran across the street. Uh, I said, in about 50 more yards, there's a sharp left-hand turn. I want you to slow down and turn the car left and, and go turn left around the corner. And he accelerated, he turned left. 
I said, in about another 100 yards, there's a hill. And I want you to accelerate up the hill. There's a car behind us now. Don't freak out. Just continue <laughs> to go. He accelerated up the hill. As we got up to the hill, I said, there's a right-hand turn. It's a sharp turn. There's a cliff on the other side. So I want you to sh turn slowly right. And don't look at the cliff. State, look forward. He turned the car left. And for the next 45 minutes, he listened to every word I had to say. <laughs> he listened, and he did exactly what I said. He didn't disagree. I said, turn left. He didn't say why. <laughs> I said, slow down. He didn't ask why. He did exactly what I asked him to do. And when we got to the end of the road, I asked him what he learned. And he said, well, Dad, I think I learned how to drive. <laughs> Actually, it's not the right answer. <laughs> but he, he, I asked him, you know, why did you listen to me? And he said, well, I listened because if I didn't, we weren't going to make it. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what was ahead of me. And I said, you know, this road is just like your life. It's just like your life. I've been down this road many times. And when I'm asking you to do something, I'm not doing asking you just to be mean. I'm asking you to do something because I know the road ahead of you as an African-American boy. I know those things you're going to face here in Oakland. I know what your college life is going to be like, you see, because I've been down that road. And just like this road, your life has many turns. And every turn, you can turn to me and we can have that conversation. When we got there, his hands were sweaty and his eyes were tearing up and you know I think he 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 learned this lesson and we actually this is actually the first time today that uh, I'm actually honored to have him here this is the first time he heard that he's sitting right in the back so is so Takai my son um, he, after this experience, he's still a 13-year-old boy. We still have our issues. <laughs> but what I realized is that despite our relationship and, and all those kinds of challenges that we have, that he still has hopes and dreams for himself. Just last summer, he created his own business. It's a photography video-making business. I had a slide, but I didn't have a chance to put it up here. In fact, as we walked in the room, because he goes to an art school, he began to name this camera right here. Now, I'm afraid that he's going to ask me for $2,000 to purchase it. <laughs> but, but in many ways, he represents thousands of the African-American young people I've worked with. That rather than focusing on the issues, the challenges and problems, that he has hopes and dreams and an imagination for his life. And that I have hopes and dreams for his, for his life as well. And I think that oftentimes we don't pay enough attention to the ways in which young people have hopes and dreams for themselves. And most of the ways in which we think about young people, particularly African-American youth, I think focus on what I call the PPP paradigm. That particularly for African-American youth, we focus on problems, prevention, and pathology. That you can Google African-American youth you could do research on African-American youth, and 90% of what we'll find about African-American youth fall in one of these three categories. We're either looking at how we prevent the problems of African-American youth, reduce the violence of African-American youth. We could look at prevention. How do we prevent African-American youth from engaging in substance abuse and early teen pregnancy? How do we focus on the pathology of African-American youth? Why are African-American youth so angry and mad? But after having worked in Oakland and started in my own organization and working with thousands of young people, I know that that is not a complete story. That the story for African American youth is not just problems of prevention and pathology, but that young people have hopes and dreams of themselves. They have an imagination. They have a way of seeing their, themselves. They have also have hopes and dreams for themselves. They can, uh, they can think about the world that they live in and have an imagination to change it. They have knowledge about what it takes to create a different type of reality. And lastly, they have, uh, they, they have hope that oftentimes we don't focus on. 
We don't see the ways in which they want to change their lives or change their world. And so today what I want to share with you is really the th uh, three following questions, and which is sort of what is the role of hope and imagination and healing for educators? How do we have hope? And what is our imagination? And how do we think of our dreams for young people? The second is how can youth workers and urban educators foster environments and relationships that bring forth hope? And lastly, how can the hopes and aspirations and imagination and dreams that young people hold for themselves contribute to <laughs> academic achievement? It is not simply, it's been said, it's not simply a, a skill set. I love what Bob said, that this is a sacred process, right? And one of the unique abilities for us as humans is our capacity to dream, is our capacity to hope. And all of us in this room are here because we have a dream, we have an imagination. And so I want to talk not simply about the skill sets today. I want to talk about my work and how I've sort of been able to reach young people and talk to them about what it is they dream about. It's a different conversation about why are you so violent. It's a different conversation than why, how can we improve your academic performance. My premise is if you allow young people to dream and you provide pathways for their hope, that everything else will fall in place. And oftentimes, as educators, we forget how to dream. And we forget how to hope. And we put our own imaginations aside. And as a result, go on to the day-to-day -day grind. And then reinforce the same kinds of challenges and problems in the classroom that don't give them permission to hope and dream. I think the, the primary function of a classroom is to bring forth one's imagination. And it is in the classroom, and if we bring forth that imagination in the classroom, we begin to see different types of outcomes. 